Hi again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the MarquetteHoops.com basketball show with the historian John Dodds and our incredible producer, Jason Ruck. I'm Tom Pippins. We are brought to you by Moonlight Graham, Modern Dental Benefits Moonlight Graham, a proud sponsor of the program, and CK. Craig Kasten is our MVP. We appreciate him very much. J.D., you come up with the most incredible guest. John Pudner is a Renaissance man, but he also is so good at what he does that NBA teams seek him out. If John Pudner is a Marquette grad from the uh, mid-'80s, and he's a master at analytics, and one of his passions is Marquette basketball. Let's tip it off with John Pudner. John, there are so many things we could say about you, Renaissance man, but we want to start where it's all at for us on this show, and that is value add. Please tell us about it. How did you get into it? Yeah, that was uh, neat. I just started playing around logically with how you score points in basketball, something only a stat geek would do, not a real player. <laughs> but uh, you start with the basic math that, well, let me see, you average one point a trip, basically. Uh, so if you go down the court and someone takes the ball away from you, you cost your team a point. And about 58 steps later and going and saying, boy, what if you miss the front end of the two shots? <laughs> you know, so, it, But, you know, just basically going out and doing the math and worked pretty well. And, you know, what's a steal worth versus a rebound? And from there just took off, you know, on these consuming weeks. And the next thing I know, the Bulls and NBA teams, Sports Illustrator colleague me, because I posted a blog on it and it seemed to work. There was a... Um... A reporter from the Pittsburgh Gazette named John Harris, not the Marquette, the old Marquette player, but he had this um, he had this system called Tendix, and basically he had the formula of if you take all the positive stats of field goal made, free throw made, rebound, assist, steal, and you subtracted all the negative stats of uh, turnover, missed shots, that type of thing. And then you divided it by the minutes played. It came, you came up with this number. And then he calculated that you don't want to have a team with Jerry Tarkanian at UNLV who has 10 times more transactions than, say, someone from Princeton who would have a Pete Carell so, uh, slowdown offense. So they he, he used a formula. And so your value add is kind of similar to that, in my view. It was so similar because the over usage, you know, and, and the thing I try to explain in layman's terms is if you're the star at a team and, you know, put up five straight missed threes, the coach says, shocker ever says, I don't care, keep shooting. That's great in college. Guess what? If you're an NBA rookie and you go out there and put up three shots, you know, I'm imagining us three months on the bench. Uh, uh, so the thing that really intrigues the NBA guys, they call it was two. One, they said, why is this Robert O'Quinn guy from Norfolk State an NBA player? And I was insistent that he was. I said, this guy is a superstar, but he is. And then why is Jimmy Butler, who was still the sixth man at the time, the big NBA star, but Hayward isn't? So I hate to say that, but I was just calculating Hayward was not and Butler was. And there was a very similar math. Butler was getting his own points on offensive rebounds. And we found the players that have to shoot a lot in college aren't usually the big stars. There are obviously a few exceptions. It's normally the guys who find other ways to get their shots. And offense rebound was the biggest one. Then it steals. And so Butler forecast is this all NBA player. But they were intrigued on O'Quinn. And so the first game uh, uh, NBA official wanted to see was Norfolk State at Marquette that year. They, they wanted to see both these players. And so that's what we watched. And that guy not only got, got credit for drafting Butler in the first round, uh, but he then got picked up by Orlando, got a promotion, and picked O'Quinn. And O'Quinn had a nice little, you know, eight-year career. I mean, decent player. So it, it was a neat two for we got to watch. Yeah, is it true that the Bulls, you had something up there, and you said this guy, Butler, could go number two or whatever, and, and the Bulls wanted him at 30? So they contacted you and said, don't don't pump him up so much? <laughs> that is absolutely correct. And I, I I won't go whole story there because I feel like there's probably some kind of yeah, but no, it was definitely a do not ever write anything. I, I didn't write anything on about her last two months. Let me say that about after that meeting. And they, they their scouts had confirmed it though. And again, not doing it. The scouts can tell if a dribble's too high. I mean, John Dodds tells me stuff I don't see. You know, I'm just a stack guy. He'll say, Well, mm -hmm. this guy has this glitch. Clearly, I just don't see it. So I, I don't see that stuff. I can see the 
But but they had scouts go out and say, hey, we, we've actually seen, you know, we scouted Oak Plant. We didn't say, oh, we're drafting because Budner said the numbers add up. I mean, they went out and looked at a Norfolk State game. And I said, boy, this guy's good. If he's really as tall as they say, and it was funny, I still remember when Quinn walked on the court at Marquette, he first looked and said, ah, oh, no, he's not really going to make it. I said, why is that? And he said something like, well, look, he's just 6'9 or something. You, know, you could see that from across the court, which I couldn't. And then he called back a few days later and said, no, no, you're right on a Quinn. Actually, we got the uh, we got the wingspan. And actually, the wingspan's long enough that even though he's slightly too short, his wingspan's long enough. And so they pick him. So that, that was the two for that day. <laughs> Oh, that is great. Uh, John, I just wanted to ask John Pudner, um, as it relates to the Marquette players, I know you did some work for John in the recently completed Big East tournament. Can you relate uh, your system, your program, to what you saw out of Marquette players against Nova and Providence, and then, of course, in the loss to UConn in the championship game? Sure. I, I would say the, the thing I've actually done is gone back and my focus is I like to go back and look at the non-conference stats for each team. So it's not so much what we just saw in the, uh, you know, third straight bloodbath against everyone. <laughs> uh, the path I see for Marquette is at the end of the non-conference season, Purdue and Marquette were the only teams with the top 10 offense and defense. And the one stat that has been 100% accurate for 20 years is you have to have a top 25 in both to be a champion. No team has won a title without being one of those exclusive 10 teams or so every year. It's actually technically it's top 40 in offense, top 25 in defense of all 350 teams. That list, there are 10 teams on that list. So theoretically, those 10 are the only chance at winning a national title. But Purdue and Marquette are the only two on that list who are top 10 non-conference. And the reason I say this is the non-conference game is so different statistically, particularly when a team has seen you for three years with a together group like this. And we've all seen that beautiful no-look pass underneath that, oh gosh, Providence has seen that 12 games and they pick it <laughs> off. And so I really go back to the non-conference schedule and that's where you know Marquette looks like a team that could make a national run this year. That's, that's an interesting point about the non-conference because – there are no secrets in the Big East. And if one coach discovers a way to stop UConn, everybody, other, other coaches will copy it. And last year, UConn was 17-0 and in non-conference. And I believe they had six losses in the Big East. Marquette won the Big East last year. UConn finished maybe fourth or fifth, but they won their 17-0 and in non-conference games. I believe it's big, a bigger story than that. I, I think they're the only team in history that won every non-conference game by double figures, and that includes the tournament. They never were taken to single digits in a game last year in a non-conference. As you said, tied for fourth in the Big East. And I think they averaged a winning margin of over 20 in the NCAA tournament, and only, I, I think, Al Cinder's great team of 68, I think, at UCLA, was the only one that compared to it with Mike Warren and Sidney Wicks. And they had just a great, I was eight years old watching that team, and it's still George Thompson. I asked him one time, what's the best, who's the best team you ever saw? And he said, the 68 UCLA Bruins. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. So, but John, you, you, uh, we sent you to the, uh, the Big East tournament. I wanted to uh, get your uh, thoughts. The, the first game Marquette played, was against uh, Nova, and gosh darn it, you don't want injuries, you don't want to get tired legs, and the first thing they do is they play another overtime game in the opener, just like they did against St. John's last year. They did it against Nova this year. What were your observations of Marquette Nova? Well, obviously it was a battle. The reason I love the bracket, (laughs) the way it was set up, is I just didn't want to play St. John's that first game, because to your point, then you're running ragged. I mean, Nova can beat you. They're smart. They can hit threes, but they're not going to wear you out. So I'd take the extra five minutes against Nova versus 40 running up and down the court against St. John's. Or let's just say a hockey game against Providence, <laughs> I mean, uh, where you really are just physically abused for 40 minutes. So uh, I'll take the overtime. Obviously, you get a little nervous with uh, going to overtime. But, you know, I felt it was good. It was more like almost the Big Ten. I mean, Illinois, Wisconsin, yeah, they played physical, but I wasn't thinking anyone was going to get injured. So 
I was fine with that draw. It was a battle. I got nervous when DePaul somehow almost beat Nova because you know they had a you know come to come to something meeting on that one, and you know, I knew they'd come out and play stronger. But I, mean, I felt pretty pretty good in that first game. So in the first game, uh, Stevie Mitchell had a great game with 15 points, and uh, Cam Jones had 18 points. Oso had an off game. It was one of the few off games he's had all year where it just wasn't coming. He was throwing the ball out of bounds. He was fumbling the ball. Um, just uh, He's a human being. He just had a bad game. You know, he did. It's funny because um, starting off that next game, I, I said to you, and I actually put it in print. I had it wrong. Uh, and you're, you know, he had a 13-footer to start off. When I look back at replay, he had a 17-footer to start that yeah, next game. You know, 25 seconds in, I said, his normal push shot. <laughs> he almost have turned into three pointers, a push shot. And so, well, that's great. And even though he, um, he, he was in the locker room saying, well, yeah, I missed a lot of those. I was like, you hit the first one. I just thought that changed the whole defense. I mean, the door was coming out further. I, I thought that was the key shot of the game. And I, I just thought it, it fixed whatever had happened at Villanova, but you're right. Uh, you know, when, when, Tyler's in street clothes and Oso's off. You, know, you definitely got a next man up there, and that's what he had to do. Sure, that second game was the Providence game. The Marquette won that 79-68. And an interesting thing you can see with Shaka, the first play, uh, the first offensive play of the game and the first offensive possession of the second half, you could really see who he's trying to focus on, who he's trying to get going. Usually it's Cam Jones might have had a bad half. Oh, let's get the ball to Cam. This, this game against Providence, he started right off with uh, Oso Iguodaro, only had five points or four points against uh, against Nova, and he hit that push shot, and 15-foot push shot, and you knew uh, it was going to be a different game. It, and it was 17 feet only because I reported it wrong, so I'm just going to keep insisting because I think that's the <laughs> longest of the year. <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, that was L order. That was Olympian Al Order taking that uh, push shot. Right. Uh, yeah. that, but that, that Providence game, I don't think I've – I think my wife Sheila said, I've never seen you more worked up than you were in that Providence game where uh, basically Ardoro was a real nice player. He's really skilled, but he's just super physical. And he was just grabbing, throwing elbows, doing things that it was – over and above where people were getting people could get hurt. I know Stevie Mitchell had a real hard pick that he ran into and hurt his shoulder. But what was your take uh, at Madison Square Garden? Did you have the same feeling uh, in house? Yeah, it, it was brutal. You're right. That was my hockey reference. And uh, yeah, again, I do. You know, he's, he's a nice interview. Really quiet guy. You know, he met in the locker room. You wouldn't think he's that tough. Uh, for, you know, friendly as can be, kind of mild spoken. But my gosh, yeah, those hits. I mean. And, and Shaka, you saw the presser after saying, look, they're moving picks on every play. The problem with this is they're moving picks that take you down. Mm-hmm. And I tell you what, I really got nervous for the championship. Stevie warming up was purposely not using his left shoulder to see if he could take jump shots, you know, set just with his right hand without even putting his left hand on the ball. It's like, oh boy, he is, he's in pain. So, um, and that was, I think, off one of those chucks. You can see him grab it. So, uh, so that was tough. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, you know, I think most of us, we all try to realize if the conference does well, everyone does well. We want to root for teams to do well. But uh, the Providence fans were giving so much abuse to the Marquette fans throughout that the NIT chant was very loud from the Marquette fans <laughs> as Marquette started to pull away. <laughs> there was no love on we want our fellow brothers in the NCAA. They wanted them knowing they weren't going. <laughs> so that was the well, favorite. I think the yeah, big use is from, from a value add standpoint. Let's talk about some of these Marquette players individually. The second team All Americans consensus, Tyler Kolick, uh, is based on the system that you have. Does that lead you to believe that he can be a successful pro? Yeah. So I think the amazing thing about Marquette, and really what every recruit should look at, is they're taking guys who don't calculate as a pro the first couple of years and getting them to a pro level. I mean, what more would you want as a prospect? Anyone who already knows they're one and done can go wherever they want. But, you know, Omax definitely had the athleticism, but certainly was on anyone's radar beginning of last year. No one thought it, that Oso or Kolek were NBA players. I'm just telling you that. That, that, was, that was not the buzz. They just they thought they had limitations. 
And now it's an argument over whether they're, you know, um, Dolich's middle second round, which I'm going to keep saying because I want to be next year's draft when he can be first round, but uh, would be my preference. But yeah, they, they've just, they've done extra things. You know, I think, um, it, and this does get it a little back and forth. You know, they, they definitely think Cam's dribble's a little too high. The handle isn't there yet. Yeah, you look, the guy's magic, you know, so it looks like one fixable thing, you know, with, you know, was Tyler quite quick enough on defense? But my gosh, the array of passing, you know, they just seem to all be coming up with something. Oh, so that can you have a forward now? We've done it at three. You know, they've all had obstacles to overcome at, well, but you are, are you going to have a guy who plays like a point guard as a forward? Because then you can overcome maybe a guy can hit a three. I think they've all just shown one skill that was so great that it overcame the initial hesitation that there was one weakness. So, they're both setting up nicely, and I got to believe Cam's there. You know, Cam is not showing up. Unless someone is doing what I did with Butler, hiding the info on Cam, no one's saying Cam's ready to go right now, but my gosh, the array of talent you got with him. He's a next-year guy is going to shoot up through the barking. So I've got big hopes for all three of them. And, and, and the other thing I should add is, you know, it used to be almost no one made it to junior or senior year and then went NBA. I mean, if you were good enough, you went freshman, sophomore year. It's been a neat trend the last few years that you actually have these senior backcourts throughout March Madness, not just us, where you got juniors and seniors bringing it up. I mean, it used to be you had, you know, the UNC and Kentucky freshman backcourt up against the fourth year from a mid-major, and that isn't true. So I'm glad they're seeing the value the NBA seems to want them to stay. I'm thrilled about NIL, the argument, but, you know, that these guys can make can make money legally at all schools, not just in a select few <laughs> where it's a little shadier, you know, and there's, you're not broke to say, you know, I mean, think we, we could add Jim Jones. The record could have improved on 49 and one. If you had image of like this back then, he could have received some money and Al didn't have to tell him no go. I, you know, I told your father, I'd take care of you as, as I've heard the story. So uh, I love NIL. I just love seeing, and just fans being able to attach to the three and four year players like we have. Yeah, you um, want to get to uh, probably the, everybody's pick for the NCAA tournament, UConn. What were your thoughts at UConn? And first, I want to again say that the, the Big East has to do something about the physical play bordering on dirty because UConn played St. John's and Marquette played Providence. And in that final game, it was 2-2 with about 12 minutes to go in the first half. And these guys, they didn't have their legs. Both teams at Hurley even said after the game, he said, boy, we were really, after playing St. John's, we're going to need an extra day off and whatever. But what, what, are your, what were your thoughts about UConn? Yeah, they, they again, are by far the best team in the country. And I've said that for a while. I mean, it was definitely Houston and Purdue are second best, if you want to be pyramid and comparable. Uh, but they're by far the best. But of course, I have to keep reminding people of brackets. That means they have maybe a 20% chance of winning the whole thing. I mean, you know, everyone has that one off day. And what's the off day for them? And can they fight through it? I'm not sure what the off day was in last year's tournament. As you said, no game was close. But, um, yeah, I just think they're so much better and complete than everyone. But, you know, we're back to do you get some crazy? I mean, I, I looked at Stetson, their opening opponent. Uh, it should be no way in the world UConn can lose to Stetson. Their two point, their two guards the last two games scored 43 points to pull out a game and 29 points. Uh, the other guard had 29 points on seven of nine three pointers. Now, I think that Tristan Newton can track down a guy and keep him from getting off nine clean looks at a three pointer, but you know it's just that dynamic. So it has to be someone else having a log game. But the team is just so complete, clinging so good. You saw the question I asked on behalf of the uh, of the board was uh you know I, mean, I, I thought he was as good as a backup against marquette last year i mean that 20 and 10 game off the bench that's where i got a little sticker out of early i said you know the, the fans were cheering for sunoco to come back in our fans were like we didn't want the backup freshman <laughs> right. killing us <laughs> right. so they're just so complete throughout you know you, you gotta brought up or something to to pull off that upset well you you play uconn and you know, there's you think you have all the holes in the dike filled, and then Jalen Stewart comes off the bench and he he hits what three out of four three pointers, and essentially every time he did it, you could see see the shoulders drop from Marquette going, oh, you've got to be kidding me. 
I mean, the scouting reports are so good and so detailed. I mean, you've seen them. These, your casual fan has no idea that you're going through, you know, a hundred pages of exactly the spot on the court that a kid could hit and not get. And to your point, though, when you're studying that again with one day's notice after a win and the, the eighth guy is the one out there killing it, I'm sure there's a lot of doubt. Now, where does this guy hit from? You know, he's unconscious. Where do we find him? So, yeah, that, that wild card, and again, it's what throws the March Madness in. Is there one of those kids that wasn't scouted as well that just has that monster day? You know, we were talking that maybe the Huskies are vulnerable to the three, so if you get those guards going, you never know. But uh, I'd like to ask you about Purdue's Zach Eady. Obviously, he's dominant in the college game. He appears to be a bit of a plotter. John, are, am I saying that he, he can't be a very good player in the league? No, but I just wonder how good he can be because of, of a lack of quickness, or do you think there are other things he does besides his gift of size that will make him be very good in the pay-for-play league? Well, I'll, I'll do famous last words. I don't think he's a star yeah, in the NBA. I mean, a clear star in college. I try to make that distinction. Uh Here's an example I'll give. When I was doing value add, I would always distinguish there's the great value add player and then there's the NBA prospect. Not always the same. The two greatest players this century in value add were Anthony Davis, no surprise there, by far the best college player. And if you had more than one year, yeah, it would have been one of the greatest ever. Okay. John Shire, Shire, who never saw an NBA court. Shire was the other player who was comparable in his value in the college game. I think Edie's the same. I, Certainly hang around in the pros, but if you watch the style of the pro game and everyone popping out hitting threes and the speed, if someone starts running a team, you got to take them off the court. You know, you can't play five on four. So he'll have his spots, but I just don't see him as an NBA star ever. With, as to the aforementioned Klingon, who seems to be pretty darn athletic, right? He can run the court pretty well. Yeah, sure he is. Uh, there's still a you love it if everyone can shoot a three. So not as many traditional centers, but Clay guy thinks a guy starts for you. I mean, he's a guy you, you know, and, and you never know. Maybe it takes a year or two in the NBA. You never know. But yeah, I, I think he's first. So I, I think he can do it all. He, he's he's much more likely to be an NBA starter even than Edie. And I'm not saying Edie can't be a starter, but I think Klingon's a pretty sure thing. You may have spots you have to take him out or a certain game matchup where maybe you slide someone else in, but that guy's complete. <laughs> And uh, you've seen some of the shots. I mean, one rejection he had on Oso. I mean, that push shot was one of those, like, when you get in a playground, don't realize the guy against you was D1 and put up a shot. You put up your whole life, and he swats at you. Where did he come from? I and mean, that's almost what one of his swats of Oso look like on a push shot. So I think Klingon's the real deal. He's going to be big. When UConn was on the run last year, uh, the expert broadcasters, analysts, remarked how good they thought Klingon's feet were. He could move on defense and on offense, and it was just clearly better than an ED. And even I really like Cockbrenner from Creighton, but he, but um, Klingon is even better than he is. He's just a real special type of player that has good feet and can move. I agree. And you look at some of those Creighton lines. I mean. Ryan only grabs a few rebounds a lot of games. And that, that's fine. We've had guys like Chris O'Toole who would box out four people so someone else could grab one. But, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think playing's far above those two. Uh, the um, wanted to ask you, uh, you had an article that we used this week at the site uh, that you were looking at all the 68 teams in, uh, that are in the uh, tournament and which teams have multiple prospects for the NBA. And I think you said there was only 11 or 12. Can you talk about that? 12, yep. Yeah, fans just don't realize that. They watch, you know, the most overused statement here is, well, why is that guy not that good in the NBA? He was so great in college, right? Because he's the 1% who made the NBA. <laughs> you know, if you got two guys who are even going to see a court in the NBA, you've got something in the tournament. And luckily, Marquette's one of the 12 of those, so... And, and there are really only four teams with three guys who can make the NBA. And that's if Colorado's big guy comes back healthy. I mean, they actually have three. They're the surprise. But, you know, other than that, unless you're playing, you know, uh, Kentucky or UConn or Duke, you know, two is, two is what you got. If you got two stars, so Oso and Tyler are, are both 
close to 100 percent we've really got something our or good friend steve the hover true the uh radio voice as you probably know john long time once said to shaka smart there's only one thing wrong with your contract after he got the 10 years he goes what he goes it's not a lifetime contract i think as a marquette <laughs> alum you're probably very excited about the future with shaka and he seems to to recruit these players who relative to value add are going to do pretty well so i'm going to claim to be the number one fan of shaka as much as that'll upset a million others but I, before coming to Marquette, lived a mile from VCU's campus, and I'm what VCU is like my second team. So to have a guy who took them to the Final Four suddenly yeah. coming back to Marquette, I was ecstatic. I think he's just perfect. I mean, you know, who do you want to go? Who do you want to go play for? I mean, ask that. I, I just don't see that many coaches out there. The guy would say, "Yeah, you know, I really would rather not play for Shaka." I mean, I think that's more. A, hey, Shaka, I'm sorry, I decided there's another match that's better for me. But what a recruiter and. My gosh, the crowd. I, I, I want to go around the stadium see during intros, does any other coach get a bigger ovation than Shaka does at Marquette mm. games? I mean, he's, he's a rock he's star. He's so classy, there. isn't he, in every way. And, and as, as J.D. has said, those kids absolutely love him and respect him. You look at him in the huddle, and they are just so attentive to him. I'm saying, man, this is months and months and almost a year-long process, and it doesn't get old. They just uh, they certainly respect and love him because they know that he cares for them. Uh, anything else that you might like to share? I always like to give John Dodds the last word, especially when he secures such an awesome guest as yourself. Well, thanks, Pip. Um, no, I just appreciate John. Uh, he's uh, been a long time uh, contributor to our site, and we appreciate his uh, his value add comments. He sees basketball from an entirely different view than I do, and I always appreciate uh, his contributions. Thank you. I really appreciate having the forum. Really a lot of fun, John. I can tell you're a great guy, too. I hope we have occasion to meet up one day. Thank you so much, and God bless you and your beautiful family. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, that's the latest edition of the MarquetteHoops.com basketball show for the great John Dodds, our marvelous producer, Jason Ruck. I'm Tom Pippins. As always, brought to you by Moonlight Graham, modern dental benefits. Moonlight Graham, a proud sponsor of the program. We appreciate you, Craig Caston, so much. John, you've got a great website before we say so long to everybody. There it is. Talk about it briefly, please. Sure. It's markethoops.com. It's part of the 24-7 network, part of CBS Digital. And uh, if you're in the viewing area uh, and can see Channel 24, obviously uh, put it on your DVR. But if you know of market fans outside the area, if you can send a link, all the shows are archived. On the left-hand margin, as you can see there, just uh, click on that link. And also, if you want to be kept abreast of as to Marquette uh, basketball uh, updates, recruits, and guests on our show, future guests, please uh, add your uh, email to our uh, email list, and we can get you out on our newsletter. J.D., thank you very much. Look forward to next time, partner. That's it, everybody. Marquette. Hopefully moving on a long way. Go Golden Eagles and God bless.